Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! So first things first, not my story, but my friends. He only told me about it as detailed as possible since it happened only a few days ago. Yes, he's okay was me posting it. We both love stories like that and the subreddit. Our cast. My friend, the entitled parent who is a Karen, got something similar to the Karen haircut but in a bad state because it was self-cut apparently. There is also the curious kid around 4 years old and the cool ticket inspector. On to the story. My friend was on his way to the town where he has his apprenticeship, taking the train like he always does approximately six hour train ride. He got on a train and to his seat that he reserved. It was one of those where two seats are across each other with a table in the middle. And there she was. The Karen of our story was her little girl. After a while my friend got bored so he took out his switch and started playing. The kid says, Mommy, what is that? A PlayStation? Ah, uh, how can one mistake a Switch for a PlayStation? Around one hour later, my friend got bored of gaming and was about to put his Switch away, and that's when it happened. The Karen grabbed his arm. My little girl can play with it now. Um, no, I'd have a problem with that. Also, the games I have wouldn't be for her. The Witcher 3, Warframe, and probably Mario Kart. We will see that. The Karen reaches for his switch, but my friend quickly pulls it away and backs it away. Again. No. This is my switch and I don't want any strangers to just play around with it. You shouldn't be so rude. That's bad behavior and I don't want my angel to see that. So give that to me. Still, I won't give you my switch. That's it. You spoiled teens. Always disrespecting adults and doing what you want. Not everyone can earn as much money as your parents. They probably bought that thing for you. So the least you can do is let other kids play with it too. Sorry, I'm already working and earning my own money with which I bought it. Yeah, sure. Finally, the cool ticket inspector arrives to check their tickets and says, Sorry, ma'am, but could you leave this person alone? Else you have to change seats. And the Karen goes silent. The inspector checks my friend's ticket and then Karen's. The thing is, Karen didn't have one. I'll write a bill for you and send it to your profile. You'll have to pay for it later. The inspector looks for her profile with her identity. You have to get off the train at the next stop, Karen. After a long argument between them, it came to light that Karen apparently dodges a fare regularly and never paid a single bill. She is banned from using the train until she pays all of them. My friend had four seats all alone for himself for the rest of his ride. Edit. Since someone commented how they'll bill her for past fee dodges without a record, my friend and I live in Germany and they keep records of that kind of stuff. Also, she was billed at those times too. I should have explained it better in the text, but our biggest railway company, the DB, has profiles for anyone they can't dodging the fee, as far as I know. And so, they can check it that way. <laughs> that story was something else. Carrie needs to brush up on her gaming knowledge and definitely keep her hands to herself. That was not cool at all. But hey, it's all good because our hero, the ticket inspector, came to the rescue and handled the situation like a bro. Kudos to you, sir. And in the end, getting the whole road to yourself? Now that's a sweet win. Anyways, let's get to our next item on the menu. I was just trying to get some shopping done for the week, without knowing that soon I'll be witnessing the most epic showdown between an entitled Karen and a mother bear protecting her cup. Well, her wheelchair-bound daughter to be exact. It begins with a store bustling with people and the shelves filled with goodies. I was making my way down the snack aisle debating whether I should go for the classic potato chips or try something healthier. Spoiler alert, I went for the chips in the end. As I approached the end of the aisle, I noticed a sweet girl in a wheelchair parked by the wall. She had the brightest smile on her face. 
and she was engrossed in a book while her mom was checking out some nearby products. Just as I was about to move past the girl and head to the next aisle, I heard a commotion behind me. Turning around, I saw a middle-aged woman, a Karen if you will, with an overflowing shopping cart, fuming with anger. She was huffing and puffing, and from the looks of it, she was having a rough day. Now, let me tell you, the girl in the wheelchair wasn't blocking Karen's way in the slightest. There was plenty of space for her to pass, but you know how entitled people are. They always think the world revolves around them. Karen shouting, Move, you useless prat! How dare you plunk the aisle? The disabled girl's mom, Excuse me, ma'am. There is plenty of space to get through. No need to be rude. I don't have time for your nonsense. Move her this instant. The mom says, I am not moving my daughter just because you're in a hurry. Plus, she is not really in your way, is she? Well, friends, you could practically see the smoke coming out of Karen's ears. She was about to explode. And I couldn't help but watch popcorn style as the drama unfolded. You regret this. And before we knew it, Karen rammed her car right into the girl's wheelchair, sending her tumbling to the ground. The poor girl was shocked and scared, and her mom rushed over to check on her. The mom shouts at this point, Are you out of your mind? What kind of monster are you? She deserved it. Now she knows better than to get in people's way. I couldn't stay silent any longer. I dashed over to help the girl up, making sure she was okay. Thankfully, she wasn't seriously hurt, but she was shaken. Meanwhile, Karen was still standing there yelling at the girl and her mom, completely unapologetic. So I myself yell, Hey, that's enough. You can't treat people like that. Especially not someone in a wheelchair. Karen scoffs. Stay out of this, you nosy brat. I ignore the insult and say, You should be ashamed of yourself. There is no excuse for what you just did. At this point, I was seen red, and I couldn't just let Karen get away with her entitled behavior. Little did Karen know, Karma had other plans. Out of nowhere, Karen let out a piercing scream. I watched as her arms were being forcefully pulled behind her back. A shiny pair of handcuffs getting slapped on her wrists, and before she could comprehend what was happening, Karen found herself restrained and unable to move. Karen was panicking at this point. Who the hell are you? Let me go! She turned around to see a wall of a man in casual clothes, menacingly staring down at her after he was done handcuffing her. The look on his face was a mix of discipline and pure anger, and it clearly sent shivers down Karen's spine. The man says calmly, I am the watch commander of the police department, and I'm also the proud dad of that disabled girl you just assaulted. And now, you are under arrest for the crimes you have committed. Karen's face turned as pale as a ghost. It was clear that her entitled actions had led her down a path she never expected. Commander says, You think you can just go around hurting innocent people and get away with it? Well, not today. You're facing serious charges for your actions. And you will be held accountable. Karen stammering, I didn't know she was your daughter. I didn't mean to hurt her that bad. It was just a little shove. A little shove? She's in a wheelchair for heaven's sake. Your actions were despicable. And I won't allow you escape the consequences. As Karen tried to come up with excuses, a watch commander began reading her the Miranda rights with an unwavering voice. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be provided for you. This is outrageous. You can't do this. Oh, I can and I did. You assaulted a minor and caused harm to a disabled girl. Your sense of entitlement won't protect you from the law. Karen protests fell on deaf ears as the watch commander called for backup to have a cruiser pick her up and transport her to the police station. You'll have plenty of time to think about your actions behind bars. As a police cruiser arrived, Karen's desperate attempts to free herself continued. But the handcuffs were secure. The officers assisted in getting her into the back seat, ensuring that she couldn't cause any further trouble. Please, you don't have to do this. I promise I won't do it again. Well, you should have thought of that before you attacked the disabled child. 
With Karen safely secured in a cruiser, the watch commander turned his attention back to his girl and her mother. He embraced her and tried his best to calm her down after what she went through. The mother thanked me for my intervention and support with a grateful and heartwarming smile. But as for Karen, well, she learned the hard way that karma doesn't discriminate based on who you are or who you think you are. So yeah, the moral of the story is simple. So yeah, the moral of the story is simple. Be kind, be compassionate, and treat others with respect, no matter their circumstances. If you think you can get away with entitled behavior, watch out. You might just find yourself facing a wall of justice with no escape in sight. Oh wow, that story was absolutely wild. That Karen though, talk about entitlement on steroids. She got what was coming to her, and justice served her a slice of humble pie. Karma does have a way of catching up to people, huh? So, if you enjoyed this roller coaster of a story as much as I did, you know what to do. Like this video, leave a comment sharing your thoughts, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now, let's move to the next one. With the NFL playoffs back on, I thought you all might enjoy this football-related revenge story. I'm a huge 49ers fan. The rapid old day tailgate in the parking lot type. A few years ago, we made it back to the Super Bowl. I was working at a consulting firm with a handful of accounts I would interact with directly. One client in particular knew how big of a Niners fan I was. I was a day-to-day -day lead on his accounts. He really liked working with me and we became friends, often grabbing drinks or dinner after our meetings. He had access to a pair of extra company seats to the game. And as a thank you, wanted to give them to me as a gift. He passed the tickets over to the partner on Matt's account, who I will refer to as Jerk Partner, to be given to me as a surprise. The game came and went and we lost. It sucked. The next time we met, we went to drinks afterward and he mentioned, Hey, by the way, why didn't you go to the game? I heard someone else was in your seats. I asked, What game? And he said the Super Bowl. Confused, I answered, I didn't have seats to the Super Bowl. He told me that he gave jerk partner a pair of his company tickets for me as a gift so I could attend. I had zero idea what he was talking about. He looked shocked, told me to quietly ask around about it and get back to him. When I was back in the office the next week, I found out through one of the secretaries that jerk partner had given a pair of Super Bowl tickets to another one of his clients as a gift from our company. I might have let this sort of thing go to keep the peace under different circumstances, but these were seats on a 30-yard line to see the 49ers play in a Super Bowl. I was pissed. I considered confronting jerk partner myself but realized it was a client who had noticed I wasn't there in the first place, so if I let him handle it, there would be no blowback on me. So I texted him, hey. I just wanted to thank you so much for thinking of me with those seats. It appears that they were given to another one of our firm's clients. He texted back right away in all caps. Are you kidding me? And then, pretend I never told you. Let me handle it. He followed up with me about formulating a plan. A few days later, we were asked to come down for a meeting in their office. The client requested the partner be present, not entirely unusual, so jerk partner and I hopped a flight the next week and headed over to their office. Little did jerk partner know, my client had orchestrated a wonderfully awkward little show to catch him red-handed. When we entered the conference room, it was all the usual suspects along with a woman in her 30s we didn't recognize. My client immediately introduces jerk partner. This is Stephanie such and such, VP from other department. She wanted to sit in on this meeting. Hey OP, you guys must already know her from the Super Bowl. She then responds as she goes to shake my hand. Oh, I don't think so. Did we meet there? I'm sorry if I forgot. The client responds. Geez, Steph, how much did you have to drink? They were sitting right next to you. The client looks at me and I say, Sorry, I wasn't there. Are you thinking of someone else? At this point... Jerk partner is looking visibly uncomfortable, probably trying to come up with an excuse. He starts in with an hmm, when Stephanie says over to him, no, 
so and so from other company were in the other seats. By the way, I was wondering why we gave company seats to those guy. Is there a project we're working with them on that I don't know about? Obviously not. They were in completely different industries. It would be like Coca-Cola partnering with John Deere. Jerk partner lets out an ah again. And the client immediately speaks over him, asking, Jerk partner, I gave you those tickets for OP. At this point, jerk partner is turning bright red. He responds, Oh, um, well, he wasn't able to make it, so he must have given the seats away to someone else. And he turns to me, looking for me to cover for him. And the client smirks at me. I respond, uh, What are you talking about? Client, you gave me tickets to the Super Bowl? The client supposedly raises his voice. Jerk partner. Those tickets were a personal thank you gift from me to Opie. Did you give them away to someone else? Was it another client? Jerk partner butts in with, Oh, um, maybe something got mixed up in the office. Client went quiet for what probably seemed like an eternity to jerk partner. He then looked down, grabbed his portfolio and iPad, put them into his briefcase and said, I think this meeting is over. OP, it seems as if I owe you a thank you gift. Let's go to lunch. Stephanie, you're welcome to join. Jerk partner, I need to evaluate our relationship. Please, go back home and expect to hear from us next week. Jerk partner suggests he would like to join, presumably to do damage control. As Stephanie sternly tells him, I don't think that's a good idea. And asks the front desk to see jerk partner out. As soon as he's in the elevator, we all break out laughing hysterically. Stephanie wasn't really a VP, just an employee at the company whose client had drafted into helping with his pre-planned meeting skit. But she did end up coming to lunch with us and was a fellow Niners fan and total place to hang out with. On our way to the restaurant, I got a desperate text from jerk partner saying I needed to cover for the firm and that we could discuss things when I got back. I replied, Yes, we need to talk, but I'll see what I can do. Client told me to wait a couple hours and then respond to him. 1. To expect invoices for the resale value of the Super Bowl tickets. Resale is way above face value. It was over 10k. As well as our lunch. He picked a pricey spot and made a big show of overspending. And that he expected them to be paid immediately. 2. Expected I be given a direct apology. 3. Expected a written apology to his company for what he considered theft. And 4. He will only interact with me or another one of our firm's partners. Never jerk partner. This whole thing caused a stir with the other partners in. I actually came off looking great because it appeared that I had made a good faith effort to save the client for the firm despite being the victim in the situation. The client would transfer to another partner, which meant jerk partner lost his profit share on any work with them. Oh, and the other partners in the firm made jerk partner pay the invoices back out of his salary. In retrospect, I really have no idea what the hell the guy was thinking. Did he seriously believe the client would just not notice me not thanking him for Super Bowl tickets? Anyway, the well was kinda poisoned for me there long term because jerk partner wasn't going anywhere. I left the firm a few months later for a much better position. The clients ultimately terminated the relationship with that firm a year later. He actually now works with a good friend of mine at a competing firm. I'm still pissed I missed out on the Super Bowl even though we lost. Hoping we make it back this year so I can finally go to one in person. Go Niners! Oh come on, seriously? Who gives away Super Bowl tickets meant as a gift? Jerk partner really got what was coming to him. And that client's plan was just epic. Big VB and the awkward meeting? Come on, that was classic. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. On to the next story. So I actually saw these revenge reddits on Pinterest and I got hooked. I was talking to my friend about this because he has a nuclear story and I wanted to share it and I was asking about details. He shot me down but he also reminded me of Dax. And basically that whole job had a bunch of great stories. I was a second year apprentice carpenter in 2012 and I got a job working up north in the oil and gas. 
We were on shifts for 12 hours a day, but they basically only gave us work for 4 hours. Our real job was not to become a statistic. I'm not saying I'm smart in the general scheme of things, but in the trades, you don't have a lot of sharp knives. I always liked math and I was good at it. On this job, I was a low man on a totem pole and I did get bullied a lot. I'm not a big guy in height or width, but I've got a sharp tongue and a quick wit. Thick skin too. There was a fourth year guy named Dax, who was on my five man team. I forgot what we were doing, but he made a wrong calculation and I corrected him. Not to be a jerk, but because, well, I didn't want our crew to get in trouble. And that's why I became his target. He was about the same height as me, but Royd White. And the anger that comes with it. So towards the end of our shift, a couple of turnarounds later, I came into the saw shack, which is basically our workshop to hide until the end of the shift. I come in and it's him, two new fives, and two other guys working. So to those that don't know, new fives are the Irish of Canada. They are so funny, and all the ones that I know don't have a meme bone in their body. Their humor is observational with that crazy accent and all their colloquialisms. So these guys were actually in a saw shop working and Dax asked me to take the output of the table saw, which is fine. I look and there is some writing on the output side of the table saw. In big black sharpie was written, Alex doesn't even know the difference between 20mm and 200mm. You're an idiot. Something like that. I'm Alex by the way. And I don't know the metric. Residential construction uses imperial and commercial uses metric. I have no reference for metric measure because I was mostly residential until this job. It was true. So the room is quiet. I feel five pairs of eyes looking at me wondering what I'm going to do. And all I can say is wow. As the hamster in my brain is on his treadmill, a mile a minute thinking. It's near the end of the shift and this is our hiding spot so some more people are shuffling in and I can feel people looking over my shoulder reading. My dad, bless his soul, was a smart guy and one thing he said was if someone is bullying you, stand up to them. You will probably get kicked but a bully only looks for easy targets and if someone fights back, there will always be another victim that doesn't. They will move on. He was more pragmatic than anything. So I asked the room if anyone had a red charby. One was produced and I began to make grammatical punctuation and spelling corrections on Dax's manifesto. So, one of the newfies and all of his accents said to the room something like, he's correcting the spelling. And the room absolutely erupted in laughter, with the exception of one person, Dax. He was so livid. Most people were laughing at the newfie humor, but that's not how Dax saw it. In front of everyone, he told me I was going to die for this. So, we had to go into our lunchroom for the chef debrief and Dax was noticeably absent. Apparently, he grabbed the belt sander and sent it off the message before the next shift could see it. But that's not the end. We were flying in and flying out and Dax lived about three hours away from me, but we shared the same major airport. So I went to my foreman who was also a newfie and gave him a heads up. He was a stone throw away from retirement and he did not like waves. Dax was a tidal wave of trouble, so we were in quasi-union. I don't actually know what they did, but I do know one thing. They didn't like to do anything except to collect dues. So my foreman calls our steward, who is the absolutely laziest guy I've ever seen. He had the world's greatest job security and he had a hammer that never got touched. Like you could take it back to the store he got it from as if he bought it yesterday. He polished it. This guy didn't like doing anything, but he especially didn't like filling out forms or defending people that are bad news. So what did he do? He called a threat against me, an incident. An incident isn't specifically an incident, it can be anything. And up north, there were lots of drugs and a condition of employment is no drugs. So the steward got Dax pissed, as in he had to do a piss test. I think the threat he made against me in itself was enough to get him fired, but the piss test was ironclad physical evidence, and Dax 
didn't pass. Once the paperwork was done, they went to Dax's room, made him pack up and took him to the aerodrome for the next flight out. Moral of the story, don't screw with the grammar police. Oh, that revenge story was an absolute gem. Clever OP showed true wits and bravery in handling the bullying Dax. Turning the tables on him was that Red Charby and correcting his message had me in stitches. It's also a powerful reminder that standing up to bullies can have unexpected consequences for them. If you enjoyed this story as much as I did, make sure to hit that like button and leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because surely there is more incredible content on the way. Stay tuned for the next thrilling storytime adventure. See you soon.